Okay. Next. Safety information. Who here has used MDMA? <laughs> Don't worry. We're not going to tell anyone. Um, who here knows that what they used absolutely for sure was MDMA? Every time you've used it. <laughs> Great. Great. So, uh, test it, guys. Yeah. <laughs> test it before you ingest it. So the number one risk of using MDMA uh, is that you're actually going to get something else um, that's either more dangerous in and of itself or that has a different safety profile that uh, you might take too much of or something of that sort. Um, and this became a issue back in the early 90s, really, probably by 1995, it was a major issue. And paramethoxyamphetamine was appearing on the market, and paramethoxymethamphetamine, PMA and PMMA, two really dangerous drugs, and they still appear, and there's a wave of deaths whenever uh, they do appear. Just in 2012, there were 27 deaths in Canada when a batch of PMMA came through. So it's about the 19, early 90s, so it didn't take long after it was banned before uh, demand for the drug, combined with prohibition and a crackdown on the precursors, generated all of these adulterants. And today, MDMA is like the most adulterated drug market in the world, hands down. And it, adulterant, adulteration isn't really the right word. People think about like, oh, cocaine, it's got cuts in it and stuff like that. You're not typically finding MDMA mixed with other things, although that does happen. Usually you're finding, you're just buying a, what you think is MDMA and it's a completely different drug entirely. Um, but PMA started killing people and one of the first advocates uh, for pill testing was Nicholas Saunders. Anyone know who he is? Anyone know? One person, two, yeah. He started ecstasy.org and um, when I started Dance if I remember, doing some research, this is 1998, and uh, I find ecstasy.org, and right on the home page was a um, obituary, because he had died tragically in a car accident uh, just two weeks earlier. And uh, I've always felt a kinship to Nicholas Saunders, like I sort of followed in his footsteps. He was also an activist on other issues uh, before he uh, started doing work on dance. But he was one of the first people to advocate for pill testing, and then, um, uh, the Dutch government, ever the leaders in harm reduction, a lot of people think because their country is below sea level and they have levees that keep them from flooding and so they're very practical people and so they have um, in many ways led the world in proper public health based harm reduction public policy, etc. And they were doing pill testing uh, for drug users at raves. It's what um, I sort of model dance safe at the beginning. So if you choose to use, how do you know what you're actually taking, given that there's so much on the market? Um, to be completely safe, there's an elaborate process you have to go through, really, and I'll say what that is. Um, you, uh, you buy something on the street, you don't know what it is. Even if you trust your best friend, they might not know what it is, right? So you have to test it first. The first line of defense are reagent testing kits. Dance Safe sells them, Bunk Police, other people now are selling them everywhere. Um, and you can positively identify the presence of MDMA, but it doesn't tell you purity. To tell purity, you have to send your sample into a laboratory, and there is one. I started it, actually. The, it's now hosted by the Arrowids. Who's been to arrowid.org? Great. great uh, site, non-biased, truthful drug information, and um, ecstasydata.org is managed by the Arrowwoods now, but it used to be on the Dance Safe site. And you can anonymously send a pill or powder in to have it tested using gas chromatography, and they will tell you the exact ingredients and the ratio. The only uh, unfortunate part is uh, they're not allowed to tell you the quantity. Uh, the DEA doesn't allow quantitative anonymous drug testing. But then at least you know you know that you have something that's pure MDMA. Then you need a milligram scale, and then you need to weigh it out. And um, dosing 
is very important to understand when it comes to taking MDMA. Uh, there's actually a wide range of dosing that recreational users uh, do, um, and, uh, but uh, first time users, new users, should stay below 125 milligrams, absolutely 100%. I don't know this for sure, but in all the research I've done, uh, reaching out to families of young people who've died, talking to toxicologists, et cetera, uh, I don't think anyone has ever died after taking 125 milligrams or less if it wasn't a, a contraindicated health condition or a drug combination. That doesn't mean, and certainly nobody has died in the clinical setting where they always give 125 milligrams or less. Um, experienced users often take more. I've heard of people taking 250 or more uh, as their first dose, but this is because the tolerance builds up, and, but that tolerance effect has a ceiling to it, very important to know. You can't just keep going higher and higher with MDMA. Um, it just won't work. Um, and that gets into the pharmacology of MDMA and why that's the case. And it's one of the most important things to understand. Uh, MDMA causes the release of the natural serotonin that your brain has already stored. Most drugs bind directly to postsynaptic receptor sites. They mimic a brain's neurotransmitter, right? Like opiates mimic your body's endorphins. You also have reuptake inhibitors, uh, like cocaine is a dopamine reuptake inhibitor. Postsynaptic receptor agonists and reuptake inhibitors will generally increase the effects the more you take. But when you have a drug that just simply releases the neurotransmitters that you already have, especially serotonin, which never was meant to be released all at once and so our brains don't replenish it quickly, then once you release it all, you can't, can take more and you continue to get high again. And that is sort of um, uh, counterintuitive to a lot of people. Uh, you know, you take a drug, you feel good, you come down, you think you can just take more and you'll get high again. Uh, and then you don't, well, because you have to take, you double the dose and take twice as much uh, when you come down. And, you know, that makes sense, right? And you know, a lot of drugs, that w that's the way it works. It doesn't work that way with MDMA. And if you do that, you increase your risk of overdose. Overdose being hyperthermia, heat stroke related. Um, uh, let me qualify this at first. MDMA, we're seeing about 15 to 20 deaths a year in the United States. Uh, it's the same in England. Um, both countries have really poor uh, drug policies, uh, so there's uh, not a lot of public health, government-funded harm reduction. Um, that's not a lot compared to most other recreational drugs, right? There are thousands of deaths related to uh, cocaine, methamphetamine, uh, more so tens of thousands a year related to alcohol and cigarettes probably trumps them all. So, but, but nonetheless, I've devoted a large part of my life to trying to reduce uh, these fatalities that do happen. Um, and so, you know, you might be thinking, oh, well, it's so rare, you know, like nothing to worry about. Um, we should worry about it. And we should worry about it not just because there's an off chance that someone you know might actually die, but also because if we don't deal with these fatalities appropriately, we're not going to affect the kind of drug policy reform that we want. I'll get into this a little bit later, but you know, marijuana uh, legalization efforts, largely thanks to SSDP, another, so thank you, um, have made it as far as they have really because it's the safest recreational drug that anyone knows. Nobody's ever died from it. And so it's been an, a, a civil rights argument that from the very beginning, you know, leave me alone, safer than alcohol, nobody's dying, you know, we have a right, it's medicine, et cetera. Um, MDMA's medicine. Uh, but 
we're seeing 15, 20 people a year die. And every time someone does, the media reports on it. They don't report on m most or hardly any, even you know, uh, uh, heroin or opiate overdose deaths or alcohol-related deaths. Um, a lot of that could be related to uh, race issues. A lot of the people dying are people of color. Fewer people of color are dying from M MDMA. Um, probably mostly it's because the rave culture is sort of demonized and considered the other and the media likes to, you know, uh, uh, sell papers and, and, and clicks and you can scare parents into thinking, oh, look, at they're listening to like this electronic music and doing these drugs and it's uh, considered countercultural, right, where nobody sees cocaine use as countercultural anymore. And I think that's going to change because EDM music is, um, you know, becoming mainstream. But for whatever reason, their MDMA deaths are widely publicized <laughs> and if we don't address them and if we don't um, explain how drug policy reform can reduce these fatalities, then we're, n we're not going to affect change. It's a, a different approach we need to take, um, and I'll get back into that more. Um, but where was I? I was talking about uh, dosing and why MDMA, you can't just keep upping the dose. Uh, even the next day, you can't really use it again and feel the same effect. You need to put at least a week or two in, depending on diet and genetics, for your brain to replenish its serotonin before you can even feel it. And that's why I can stand up here and really confidently say that MDMA is really a non-addictive drug. You know, it, people can become compulsive in their use of anything, and we see compulsive ecstasy users, for, for sure. They're typically uh, weekly users, though. They take too high doses, they take it too often, but it just generally doesn't work if you try to take it every day and you increase your risks. Even the next day, you're not feeling things, but you will have MDMA in your brain and you take more MDMA and you're really upping the amount and that can lead to um, emergencies and fatalities. So, heat stroke, hyperthermia, what's the relationship between MDMA uh, serotonin syndrome and hyperthermia or heat stroke. This is a very important point. Uh, people who have been following my writings know and my work with Dan Safe, I'm constantly saying don't call them overdoses uh, because really it's a combination of environment uh, with dose. But even a normal dose of MDMA uh, can increase your risk of heat stroke hyperthermia uh, if you are in a hot environment uh, you're not uh, consuming enough water, you're not taking breaks from dancing, and the vast majority of fatalities that we see uh, are in nightlife or festival settings where it's really, really hot. Um, and by calling them overdoses, we're sending the wrong, me we're sending this message that as long as you don't take too much, you're gonna be okay, and that's actually not true. Well, I don't think anyone's died from, and I could be wrong, uh, from 125 milligrams or less, we've certainly seen medical emergencies that have resulted from that, heat stroke emergencies. Um, and so the environment is very, very crucial to understand and your behaviors while you're on it. Uh, the euphoria can mask the symptoms of dehydration. Um, typically what we see is young people who are dropping on the dance floor. Um, the other interesting thing I've, I've learned over the last couple years as I've been doing more work and as these fatalities have been increasing, and I'll, you know, I want to explain why, too, the fatalities are increasing, so don't let me forget to tell you that. But the one interesting thing we're seeing is that almost all, I haven't, uh, all of the, the fatalities I've researched when I've really talked to friends and family of the, the, the deceased, uh, they're all happening in relatively new users. Uh, people who have not taken the drug m more either at all before or just a handful of times. And what that uh, says to me is that there's a small percentage of people who are hypersensitive pr or predisposed for whatever reason to hyperthermia or heat stroke and they are having a sort of idiosyncratic reaction to the drug that most people don't have. Um, 
and uh, that could be related to norepinephrine and blood pressure. We lose our heat through the surface of our skin, uh, through the capillaries, and when your blood pressure increases, the blood flow doesn't get to the surface of your skin, and so you, the heat stays in, and you feel cold. And I've actually seen a couple of people who, even on a normal dose of MDMA, sort of had this reaction where they, they felt like they were too hot, but yet they were also shivering because their skin was cold because the blood wasn't getting there, but that meant they also, th the heat was being trapped inside, and because they were shivering, they put a blanket on. It was like, no, no, you know, don't do that. That's just going to keep the heat in even more. Um, it's really a mystery. Scientists are still trying to figure out, well, you know, maybe why a young woman in Britain died, and uh, forward-thinking pathologists suspected uh, malignant hyperthermia, which is kind of a predisposition towards a heat stroke, um, but serotonin drugs in general uh, increase your risk of hyperthermia by um, inhibiting your body's ability to maintain its temperature. Even uh, Prozac has a warning when you use it that you're more susceptible to uh, heat stroke. Um, who's got a warning label about being susceptible to heat stroke uh, when they purchase their MDMA? Yeah, right. Nobody's got that warning because MDMA is illegal. And uh, doing uh, educational efforts like this are um, uh, uncommon. They're <laughs> difficult. Again, thank you for having me at SSDP. Um, okay. When I started Dance Safe back in 1998, we were seeing maybe three to five fatalities a year. And almost all of them were related to PMA or PMMA. Um, now, we're seeing 15 to 20 a year, and many of them, more than half, if you look at some of the statistics, the person had only taken MDMA alone. What's going on here? Suddenly, we're seeing uh, this huge increase in fatalities, uh, and, and w are on the Molly or ecstasy market, and most of them are pure MDMA. Uh, not one of the, these adulterants that are really dangerous like PMA. Um, ironically, it's because the market has become even more adulterated, and particularly adulterated with the cathinone class of drugs, also known as bath salts. Um, and I'll explain why. It, it's, it's not as so much that the, all of the bath salts are uh, more dangerous, have a uh, higher risk profile than MDMA, although many of them do. Methylone is the most common one on the market today. Who's taken methylone? Yeah, a handful of people. What, what's, uh, what makes harm reduction efforts more difficult today than back in 1998 is back then, if you took a drug, if you, if you got a pill and it wasn't um, MDMA, you generally didn't like it. And, uh, but today, there's so many new synthetic drugs out that uh, a lot of people like. Um, I actually, a couple years ago, took methylone. I sought it out and I took it. I wanted to see it. I knew it was, I didn't really like it. It, to me, felt like uh, just uh, sort of just a stimulant, a short-acting stimulant. And then, you know, I came down and felt somewhat dysphoric, you know. But a lot of people do like it. And what's happening today is people are taking methylone, but it's being sold to them as Molly. And the user behavior, the community, is starting to use Molly more like they would a traditional stimulant, rather like cocaine or meth, redosing, taking little bits, snorting it, et cetera, rather than you would a traditional psychedelic uh, where you take one dose, you come up, you have a plateau, you come down. That people are taking Molly today in ways that reflect how methylone works or other bath salts, but they believe it's MDMA. And then they're taking, then they finally get MDMA for the first time and they're using the drug inappropriately in a way that greatly increases the risk because they don't know, they don't know the difference. They just think it's molly. Uh, a starting dose of methylone, a normal starting dose, can be 250, 300 milligrams, and you can keep taking it for days at a time. You've, 
we have this flock uh, uh, epidemic nowadays, supposedly, which is being blown out of proportion, but it's a good example. It's the first cathinone, it's actually alpha PVP, cathinone class drug that sort of hit the, the proverbial streets in low income neighborhoods, particularly in Florida, um, and is a basalt that's being used on a daily basis. And People are confusing it with Molly, and the media is confusing with Molly, and MDMA, and the whole thing is just getting confused. And it's not, but it's not just the media that's confused; it's actually the young college students, the user community that doesn't know the difference. Um, so the the influx of cathinones on the market is uh, the first punch that's causing more fatalities: the confusion between that and MDMA. Uh, and the second thing is that, at least in the U.S., uh, press tablets seem to have disappeared. Um, who, who, who's seen press tablets a lot in the last uh, year? Yeah. Uh, and uh, but what, ha, well, what about loose powder? I'm assuming everyone has seen that, right? Like, loose powder. Everything is loose powder these days. Yeah, uh, uh, Molly, and the way that the young people define it, right, ecstasy, were the press tablets with colored dyes and a logo stamped in it, and Molly is a loose, loose powder, and Molly is supposed to be pure MDMA. I have an interesting story about where that came from, too, by the way. But um, we know it's not pure, uh, and we know that the majority of, them I of it is actually bath salts. Oh, let me bring up a visual. I need to plug in again. This is um, Molly confiscations in the New York division of the DEA uh, ooh, between a certain period of time, um, uh, 2009 through 2013. For MEC is probably not around a lot, really. It might have been just a big confiscation. Methylone nowadays is the most common if we look at ecstasy data or dance safe uh, testing. Um, but it's just a good visual you can see. We don't really know what the percentages are, but MDMA is not uh, in the majority uh, when you buy Molly on the street. So press tablets back in the day um, had this interesting kind of uh, psychological serving size like limitation where young people rarely took more than two, right? Because you're only supposed to take one. Well, maybe it was a week you'd take two, but you didn't really take th three or four very often. We didn't see, I didn't see that working with DanSafe. Now that it's all loose powders, nobody you knows how to dose, and people are finger dipping, and they're you know, dividing up little piles, and 125 milligrams is a really tiny amount. Like you know, when you weigh it out. And so people are taking much larger doses nowadays <coughs> than they were just simply because things are in the form of loose powder. Combine that with the influx of methylone and, and we're we've fatalities have quadrupled. Uh, that's my assessment of the reasons why. Uh, yeah, question, why not? Has overall usage also gone up? That's a good question. Um, one of the problems w in finding the answer is that the um, organizations that do the surveys haven't figured out th that uh, young people uh, are calling ecstasy and Molly different things. So the Monitoring the Future program, which is the most reputable uh, you know, drug user survey in the United States, that surveys uh, young people of all ages, have you done this drug in the last year, blah, 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 they aren't even asking about Molly. So they are going to ask high school kids, have you taken ecstasy? Oh, of course not, right? Because, but to them, ecstasy is different from Molly. So um, uh, we don't know. It seems to be about the same, a little bit greater maybe as we saw back in the late 90s. Um, certainly, there's um, uh, a lot more drugs on the market, and like I mentioned earlier, the cathinones have a desirable appeal in their own right, and so their um, uh, the use might be higher just because of that. Um, 
What did I say a minute ago was an interesting story? Oh, how did, uh, okay, tangent. How did the word Molly come about? This is very interesting to me because uh, when I first started going out to raves, I wasn't an uh, EDM enthusiast. Um, the music's kind of grown on me, I have to admit. I was a punk <laughs> when I was a teenager. And so my first rave was in 1998 behind a dance save booth. And um, the first thing that I learned in talking to young people, and these are all ages events, is that most people didn't even know that ecstasy at the time was its own drug, or supposed to be MDMA, right? To them, well, what is ecstasy, I'd ask. Oh, ecstasy are these little pills that are sold at raves. Some of them make you feel good, and some of them make you feel bad. And I was like, okay, well, what's in the ones that make you feel good? Oh, it has a good combination of heroin and cocaine, and they would list off the drugs that they knew the names of. And are the bad ones? Oh, it has a bad combination of drugs. That's what they thought that ecstasy were pills of, that contained drugs, and sometimes it had a good combo, made you feel good. They didn't even know that ecstasy was supposed to be MDMA, its own molecule. So we began, and I trained all the local chapters to start at the basics. MDMA is its own molecule. And back then, if you found loose powder in the 90s, Generally, it was being manufactured in North America, in the US and Canada. And the vast majority of ecstasy tablets were being imported. They were being manufactured in Eastern Europe. Interesting history. MDMAs criminalized uh, a few years later. Soviet Union collapses. Uh, Berlin Wall comes down. You have all these former Soviet public republics who now need to make hard currency. And uh, the uh, you know, best guess here is their governments were turning a blind eye to manufacturing and selling uh, MDMA uh, to the West because they could make money that way if their governments weren't doing it themselves. Um, this is why the rave culture took off in Europe about five, ten years before it took off in the U.S. because it took that long for the export channels to be developed. It's sort of the reverse. What are you saying, Justin? No, no, that's not, not it at all. It, rave culture was, is not totally predicated on um, MDMA channels. Absolutely not. No, no. And in fact, it started more in the US. I remember friends of mine in the 80s. But rave culture associated with MDMA blew up in Europe before it blew up in the US. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, rave culture is not predicated on MDMA. It's a viable music <laughs> in its own right. <laughs> I'm on record saying that. But people can't deny that the drug uh, also promoted the culture in the same way that LSD promoted folk music in the 60s. And the reverse happened then, right? The hippie movement began in the US about five, ten years before it took off in Europe, and that's because it, most of the LSD was being made in the US. But anyway, back to where this interesting story. Um, so uh, if you got white powder in the late 90s, you generally were getting pure MDMA because it was being made in North America by chemists who were more about you know, spreading the love uh, and weren't trying to just, I mean, they were making enough money anyway. They weren't trying to maximize their profits like the Eastern European criminal manufacturers were, where they would do things very specifically, like release a batch of blue Teletubbies that was, you know, 140 milligrams MDMA, and it got this great reputation. And then a few months later, they would put out, you know, half a million doses that had 80 milligrams, and then they'd put out a bunch that didn't have anything, and then they would maybe put out some PMA and kill some people, but they would maximize their pro and then they would switch the logo to bring it, uh, build a new reputation, not to mention all of the other copycat manufacturers that would do the same. Um, and so ecstasy really very quickly got a bad name, as it should. It was mostly not MDMA even back then, but if you happen to find the white powder, it generally was. And so young people started calling the white powder molecule, which I believe was based largely on dance safe educational efforts that MDMA is its own molecule. And then molecule became Molly, and then the rumor that Molly is pure MDMA 
stuck and is causing as many problems today as that we had back then when it was press tablets. So that's that interesting story. 